Hello and welcome. Today we're going to do an example of liquidated damages. So we've talked previously on the channel about liquidated damages. I'll just do a very high level summary today as we're working through this. We'll talk about some of the higher points of it. If you want more detail about liquidated damages, what they are, why you might need them, we've covered that in other videos here on the channel. Today is about really working through a concrete example of where we might see a liquidated damages clause in a contract and why it might be meaningful and potentially change an outcome. So let's dig into it. Let's let's assume that we are dealing with a contract for the construction of a piece of commercial real estate today. So we've got a buyer who's buying the property that is being developed and then we have the seller, right? So we have two parties here, uh, which is standard in a contract, right? Often you have two parties to a contract. You could have more, but you need at least two. So buyer and seller, and buyer says, I want a liquidated damages clause. I want to know that you're going to be done building this building by a certain date. And if you aren't finished by that certain date, you know, I'm going to have costs, right? I'm going to have to stay in my, I'm going to have to hold over my lease at the other place. Uh, I'm not going to be able to start transferring my employees over to the location. I'm not going to be operating out of the new location. Uh, it's going to make costs, right? Because I'm going to have to pay additional expenses. So I want a certain date in this contract, a done date. And I want what we call a liquidated damages clause. I want to know how much money I'm going to get if you don't get done by that date, because I want some certainty, right? I want to be able to know that I can pay uh, to extend my lease. And I may have to sign a year lease and then I may have a lease break fee. You know, I, they're kind of doing the math in their head and they're knowing it could be expensive to do this. So first question is, can you have a liquidated damages clause in that case? Well, probably yes, right? Unless there's some specific statute or other thing that overrides the common law. There's no reason you can't. The next step is, you have to then fix a reasonable amount. And you can see that from what I'm describing in this example, that the buyer already has some reasonable ideas of what it's going to cost to uh, potentially have a problem with occupancy, right? They're talking about, uh, you know, lease costs, keeping additional space, right? Because if the new space is not ready, obviously they're going to have to continue in their old space or a temporary space. You know, maybe costs of bringing clients into the new space. Maybe they want to host events and they think that that can generate revenue and events. And so they are definitely seeing that there will potentially be damages. Why would that buyer want liquidated damages? Because they want to know now what that dollar amount is and so they can budget for it if there's a problem. Right? What they don't want to do is have a problem, have their occupancy be delayed, and then have to go to court and talk to the judge and, and jury about how much damages they have, right? To make a whole presentation about, well, we had to pay this much to extend our lease, and then we had a lease break fee because we had to extend our lease to stay where we were. And, you know, we would have had this event, and people would have come in there, and we may have more, sold more products, we may have grown our business, and that cost us this many dollars, right? You can see that it's getting more and more uncertain, right? The certainty of the lease cost and the cost of not having a new space is, is very concrete, right? We can calculate that quite easily. Uh, what we have a hard time calculating is some of these follow-on things, right? Well, what does it cost if we can't move into the new space? What does it disrupt our business? How does that impact our potential clients? So what needs to happen now at the time of the contract formation, at the time of contract signing, is it needs to be a reasonable estimate of what those potential future damages are. But you can see that the buyer is getting into that mindset. And so somebody needs to work with the buyer, and this is usually a collaboration between the attorney and the client, to build up a reasonable estimate of the damages and work that into the liquidated damages provision. Because again, most courts, as we've discussed in prior videos, are not going to allow an unreasonable liquidated damages amount. But if you can build documentation around it and make some good faith estimates, now you're moving towards having a reasonable liquidated damages amount. So start cataloging all of those expenses. And there's additional follow-on stuff that we haven't talked about yet. Not only do you have the lease of the old building, you have the opportunity cost of not having the more beautiful newer space. 
Uh, maybe you have moving crews and an IT team that's scheduled to come in on the weekend and the move. A lot of people like to move businesses on the weekend. So you've got everybody lined up you know, for the first weekend of October. And now you got to pay everybody because they all change their calendars around to be available the first weekend of October. Your moving crew is not going to be able to move. Your IT team is not going to be able to set up all the computers. And now you are moving forward uh, this disruption. So you have a bunch of expenses, right? But these are all documentable expenses that are all part of the reasonable part. And I believe most courts are not going to give you trouble either with doing some projections of opportunity costs of you know other things that you might incur in the event of a break. And so you got to get all that reasonable numbers built into it. And then you would have a contract drafted. You would have the seller and the buyer both agreeing to what triggers the start of the use of the liquidated damages provision. What is a breach, right? At what point uh, is the seller liable to the buyer, right? And so uh, we would want to get some certain language around that. We want to think about the situation, right? So we're talking about a buyer having a building on a certain date. And so that means generally that the seller is going to have to, seller slash builder is going to have to finish their work by that date. But there also might be inspections and occupancy, right? So uh, issues and other things with the local county government, right? So what is the standard? Is it that the building is ready and done on a certain date? Or is it that the seller has gotten all of the necessary permits and that the you know buyer can you know open the door and move into the space? And these are the types of things that if I was representing the buyer, I'd want the seller to be motivated to finish the inspection process to get everything buttoned up and to really be able to hand over the keys on or before the date certain in the agreement. right? So these are the types of things you're going to build out in that clause. And then you're going to set forth the liquidated damages amount. And one of the real benefits here is that if we do have a breach, you now have a certain amount of money that is due. And so that takes a whole phase out of the potential litigation, right? Because what happens a lot of times in these litigations is not only do you have to prove that somebody broke the contract, i.e. the seller didn't have the building ready by the date they promised, that's part one of this, but another part of this is not only did they not have the building ready, but how much did it cost you? And so well, one of the reasons we want liquidated damages clauses is we want a certain amount. So now by building that in there and having the amount in the contract, we know how much the seller has to pay over to the buyer for a delayed closing. Now, of course, there can be a lot more things that go into negotiation here, right? What if... Uh, it's a one-day delay versus a 15-day delay versus a three-month delay. Are there tiered amounts of damages, and are all, each of those tiers reasonable? We could build that in there. Uh, what if there's a delay? What if there's not a fault on the case of the seller? I mean, if I'm representing the seller, I'm thinking about, well, what if uh, what the buyer misses a payment earlier in the cycle, right? Does that move our deadline back? What if um, you know buyer doesn't do some of the paperwork with the county or the city to get the permit, right? I'm going to, as the seller and the builder, I'm probably taking the lead on that, but I'm probably going to need cooperation and input from the buyer uh, to fill out some of this governmental paperwork and to get everything processed through. Well, what if it's their fault, right? These are the types of things that we're going to be thinking about in the negotiation process. We want to get a lot of certainty. We want to be very sure what a breach is. Uh, what triggers the payment of liquidated damages, and then we want to be very sure about what the liquidated damages amount is so that we know what that is. Obviously, that's usually more concrete because usually liquidated damages is a fixed dollar amount, so we know what that is. Now we want to make sure it's reasonable uh, to make sure it's enforceable because a lot of courts are not going to enforce penalty provisions. They just want to compensate for damages. What's left on the table now is if there is a breach of contract, now we have a case not as much about damages. We're not talking about proving up the amount of damages. We're not talking about those types of issues. We're talking about did the contract get broken or not. And so both parties are going to come in and present their case on whether it was broken or not. Now, if there's no additional clauses, there's no offsets, there's no reasons for delay and provisions that allowed for a delay, we have potentially a pretty open and shut case. I and mean, if the contract says the building needs to be delivered on 
X date and it's not delivered, it's not ready by X date, you see how much this is a simpler case for the buyer to put on, right? This really reduced their attorney's fees. It reduced the number of issues that needed to be developed for trial. It streamlined things. It's probably a much faster trial versus a situation where we're not very clear on what triggers the damages. And if we don't have the damages amount sucked down to a number in the form of a liquidated damages provision, we're probably going to spend a lot of time going back and forth about the losses and the costs and whether they were offset or not. And that can really take a lot of time. So there's a concrete example of liquidated damages in use for you. That gives you some ideas to talk about with your attorney and what you're developing and making sure that you have good provisions in your contracts, highlight some of the issues. So if you have questions or comments that are general in nature, you can drop them below. Don't put anything confidential because other people might see your comments. So don't put specific things about your business or your situations you're in. For confidential communications, go talk with an attorney. If you see this video and you choose to subscribe, drop me a comment. Let me know. I always like when new subscribers comment. It gives me a chance to interact with you and get to know you. And whether you're a new subscriber or been around for a while, uh, let me know if you have topics or ideas you want us to cover in future videos about business, business law, and the future of business. All right, folks, thanks for tuning in today. Look forward to seeing you for another video soon, and keep pushing there.